Ben, I, I've been thinking all day that back uh, when we had that, uh, what was called the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, uh, and people, a lot of people had beef about it. They thought it wasn't the best deal around. I, I always thought the one thing that it does do is it gets America and Iran around the same table. Something that hasn't happened, uh, something that we haven't had in place when October 7th happened and we, we needed to use influence over Hamas and something we don't have tonight. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, <clears throat> during that nuclear deal, it obviously put a lid on the Iranian nuclear program. It also created a diplomatic framework for the U.S. and Iran to have direct discussions and try to resolve disputes and de-escalate tensions. It didn't solve every problem. I, I think the challenge that we're seeing here now, in addition to the fact that we haven't even mentioned the fact, uh, Ali, that that nuclear program is advanced to kind of the doorstep mm -hmm. of the nuclear weapons capability. So that lurks in the backdrop here, too. But the other problem is nobody's just listen to the conversation we've been having. Nobody's quite sure of everybody's intentions here. Right. There's the Iranian intentions. There's the intentions of the Houthis. There are the intentions of these proxy groups in Syria and Iraq. There are the intentions of Hezbollah and Lebanon. There are the intentions of Hamas. All of these groups have different motivations here, even if they are networked and connected together uh, through the support that they receive from Iran. And the U.S. and Iran, I'm sure right now, are communicating probably largely through intermediaries, through the Chinese and the Qataris, the U.S. passing messages, telling the intermediaries, look, we have to do what we have to do to protect our people, back off, but we don't want a war with you. And the Iranians doing the same thing. The problem we've seen in the region, though, Ali, since October 7th, is everybody says they don't want to escalate, but it's been escalation. Mm -hmm. You know, the U.S. has now been involved with the Houthis in Yemen. Now we take these strikes. There are going to be more. Uh, the Iranian proxies have obviously taken all kinds of shots at the U.S. We see the Israeli military operation continuing kind of unabated in Gaza. Uh, that's why this feels so uncertain, because there's so many different parties, and a lot of them are not talking to each other. Ben, uh, to the extent that these are precision uh, strikes, they are on uh, what we believe to be military targets. Uh, there is always a fear when there's dry kindling of someone lighting a fire. Uh, what, what's the danger of a miscalculation here? What's the danger that if Iran doesn't really want to get into a war and America doesn't want to get into a, a war, that somehow someone's going to get us into a war? Well, first of all, keep in mind, these groups have been through war. Uh, so these are obviously you know, powerful strikes from the U.S., but every group involved in this has been through the Iraq War. They've been through the Syrian Civil War. The Yemenis have been through a war there. What I'd be looking for is, does somebody, one of these groups, try to take another shot at the U.S. Uh, that gets through our defenses? Does Hezbollah in Lebanon decide they got to turn the dial up in terms of the rockets that they fire into Israel, and then suddenly that? front, that Israeli Hezbollah front uh, in flames. The U.S. did not, by the way, take a shot at Hezbollah here tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty careful. They're not taking a shot in Iran. They're not taking a shot at Hezbollah. It's going to be in Iraq, Syria, and probably Yemen so far. Does the Houthis, they're, they're clearly not deterred. They're continuing to launch strikes in the Red Sea. Do they sink a ship? You know, any one of these things could escalate, because as we've seen, the U.S. didn't want to get involved. But when a drone got through in Jordan, we felt compelled to because three of our people were killed. That, that shows you that sometimes an event can draw you deeper in. And again, the pattern since October 7th, so long as that war goes on in Gaza, mm -hmm. the pattern has been there's always something that leads to a reaction. And Ben, there have been things that have happened in the last few days as it relates to Israel and, and Gaza that I see as, as, as somewhat hopeful. A hopeful idea is that there was a, a, the framework of a deal worked out between the Mossad and the CIA and the, the Egyptians and the Qataris. It was presented to the Israelis, despite the fact that Netanyahu said no chance. The Israelis have said, we, we probably kind of accept the framework of this deal. And, and Hamas has done the same thing. They've said, we're considering it. There are things that we want that are not in this deal. But uh, the, the, not everybody did what they have typically been doing in recent weeks and saying, forget it, we're not even thinking thinking about this. Uh, is there some uh, sense that you've got that, that we may be moving toward a deal to get the release of the hostages and perhaps a ceasefire, if not a, an outright end to this war? I think there's definitely an effort to try to get a portion of the hostages out. Uh, you know, the, the idea is clearly coalesced between a lot of different parties, Qatar and Egypt playing a key role here between Israel and Hamas and the United States to have a pause for a period of time and begin to get hostages out. I think what the U.S. would really prefer and like is if that pause becomes essentially a ceasefire where you can begin to explore diplomatic avenues like 
what's the future of Gaza? How is Gaza going to be administered? Can the Arabs come in in some kind of peacekeeping role? How is it going to be rebuilt? Can we get something moving towards a Palestinian state? The challenge is, Bibi Netanyahu has made clear he's not signing on to that. And so I think a pause would be great for hostage releases and also to get aid into Gaza where people desperately, desperately need it. The challenge, though, is if it's not permanent, and then there's a resumption of the war. We saw last time, once the war resumed again, the Israeli military operation resumed again, things went back up, yeah. temperature went back in the region uh, again. So even this probably makes it a little more complicated to get that ceasefire going because, you know, Israel may not want to show that it's backing down in the context of a regional escalation. Hamas may have Iranians saying now's not the time uh, to stop the fight. Um, so all this, you're, you're playing multidimensional chess with a lot of actors. And to your original point about the JCPOA, you know, diplomacy is something you do not just with your friends. You have to do with your adversaries. Yep. And we have to find ways to have channels that work in reducing tensions. If we really don't want a regional war, the only way to avoid it is to talk. The Biden team can say, well, if things are so bad, how come the stock market's on a roll? Because they think I'm going to be elected. That you think the stock market's rallying because people think you're going to be elected? I do, yeah. You know, that makes no sense at all, right? That the stock market would be rallying in February because Donald Trump might be elected in November and take office almost a year from now. The Dow Jones had another record close today and had absolutely nothing to do with Donald Trump's wild imagination. Here's the Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell this week with his take on the economy. This is a good situation. Let's be honest. This is a, this is a good economy. There was even more evidence of that today in the blockbuster jobs report. The U.S. economy added 353,000 net new jobs last month. That's double the number that economists had predicted. Wages climbed to 4.5% year over year. That is higher than the 4.1% that was forecast. The unemployment rate held steady at 3.7%. The unemployment rate has now remained below 4% for two consecutive years. That is a remarkable and rare achievement. Today, President Biden tied the good economy to good policy, saying, quote, it's great news for working families that wages, wealth and jobs are higher now than before the pandemic. And I won't stop fighting to lower costs and build an economy from the middle out and the bottom up. As for Republicans who might not be listening to the White House, they could very well hear it from an unlikely news source. If you own your home at a low fixed rate mortgage, 3%, and the, and the value of your home is going up, that is wealth accumulation. And you have a fixed rate mortgage, you have a fixed payment every month, and your wages are increasing, that is extra spending money. Mm. That's how you benefit from inflation. And people are out spending. And the messaging from the RNC has been way off base. Falling inflation and rising growth gives the U.S. the world's best recovery. Steve Forbes with me this morning. I think the Democrats are going to run with that headline. I mean, they're just <laughs> going to plaster this all over the place. But are they right? Is America, does America now have the best recovery? Well, yes. We had a blowout jobs report. More than twice the consensus expectation. Now, I know many of my conservative friends are trying to drill holes in this report. But you know what, folks? It is what it is. It's a very strong report. Mia culpa, I was wrong about the slowdown in the recession. Joining us now for a very short segment, because I don't know what work he's got to do, is Jared Bernstein, the chair of the White House <laughs> Council of Economic Advisors. Jared, they're doing your work for you over at Fox News. Uh, usually someone well, can you know, poke I'm holes I, in I, these things, I, but I, they're, they're, they're doing it. Uh, first of all, I want to say that it's it's very possible the stock market's up because they knew I was coming on your show tonight. Uh, look, well, we heard we while heard there's nonsense of, in the uh, air, why not add more, right? Uh, we heard we heard a lot of uh, you know honest assessments of what's a, a very strong economy right there, and I I give uh, uh, kudos to folks who are recognizing that. I think it does get a little hard not to see when you've had unemployment below 4% for two years running. Uh, we haven't seen a streak like that since uh, the 1960s. And of course, uh, the big job number uh, today, 353,000 
well above what was expected. Uh, it's not the first expectation busting report we've seen in recent months and quarters. As you know, we had the same thing with GDP uh, just a week or so ago. So the American economy continues to defy expectations as Bidenomics continues to grow the economy from, as the president said, the middle out, bottom up. Let's talk about how this happens. You've got a situation in which we had inflation uh, growing at a rate that was faster than wages. Now you've got wages outpacing inflation for several months now. Uh, and you've got low unemployment, you've got more job creation. So people start to feel that. And then they get these phone calls from pollsters or interviewers at the uh, University of Michigan. And, and the consumer confidence numbers start to show confidence. And then people have to talk about it because people talk to one another about it. Uh, and they talk about it on Fox News. And then people realize that they've been hoodwinked a little bit. In reality, a year ago, there was some concern of a, a recession. And it was it was widespread. It wasn't uh, weird conservative talking points. But now people are understanding that the, the talking points don't match the reality in the economy. Uh, exactly. We, we've had a real gap between the kind of economic indicators you and I were just talking about, which have been solid for a while now. I told you about the, uh, the unemployment rate staying low for so long. But in fact, wages have been beating prices on a year over year basis for about 10 months now. That's a that's a trend. That's not uh, a, a blip. And it is now factoring into sentiment and consumer confidence surveys in a way that looks pretty uh, reliable. And in, in some cases, using a word that uh, one of the pollsters did today, we're seeing surges. So the uh, University of Michigan survey, a widely watched uh, indicator of sentiment, uh, was up 13% uh, uh, in January and 14% uh, in, in December, about 30% overall. That's a great jump. So we're seeing that in a couple of other indicators as well. It does seem like the, the gains to working families are starting to show up in, uh, in sentiment about how the economy is doing. I want to put up a Quinnipiac poll that talked about the most issued, uh, urgent issues facing the economy. Now, as you and I know, Jared, the economy is, generally speaking, always hangs around uh, the number one or number two, but it's actually become the number two. And preserving democracy, according to this poll, is uh, the most urgent issue facing the country today. Uh, immigration is, is number three. That tends to be a concern more for people who identify as Republicans than Democrats. But uh, talk to me about the democracy issue and, and how that uh, affects the president and, and the things he talks about, because he's out there talking about the fact that the economy's fine and we can fix it and various people can run it. Uh, but democracy is something that actually might go away this very year. Look, I'm an economist, uh, but when I hear uh, Joe Biden uh, talk about uh, preserving democracy with the urgency, the dedication, the passion uh, that you hear from him on this issue, um, uh, I think uh, it's not only uh, myself, but lots of people are very moved by that. Uh, it's obviously critically important uh, to recognize that ranking that you just showed. Now, look, when it comes to the economy, uh, we know we've got more work to do. We've made real progress. We're going to build on that progress. When it comes to preserving democracy, uh, obviously, that's one of the president's top priorities, uh, and uh, he will continue to push that uh, from any uh, corner uh, where he sees uh, that uh, extremely valuable institution threatened. Gina, let me start with you. Uh, this is uh, an important thing for people to understand. There are lots of impediments to reproductive freedom and generally freedom in, in Texas. Uh, unusual in a political season to look at the courts, but it's something that we're finding out is increasingly necessary across this country, but particularly in Texas. You're absolutely right. Um, and this is the very first uh, attempt to change the makeup of the, the composition of the court. And, and let's be very clear, um, you know, when I first uh, read about the, the Kate Cox case in, in December, it raised those two questions, which is how close is close enough? Um, and who are these partisan judges? Again, we elect our judges and our justices uh, through partisan elections. Who are these folks to know better than a woman's doctor what is necessary for her? And then lastly, the question is, well, how do we get to a better place? These justices are elected. That means they can be unelected. And that's why when we look toward November, we are going to hold Jimmy, John, and Jane accountable for their actions that have made it more dangerous to be a woman in Texas, especially when you look at medical exceptions. Um, the the um, University of Houston's uh, School of Public Affairs, Hobby School of Public Affairs, they did a survey last February that, that when they surveyed folks, 82% of folks surveyed 
um, said that they support medical exceptions, right? So that means when a woman's life is, is threatened or when loss of bodily function is threatened. So th it's not even close. Right. Um, this, we have an opportunity. We are not hopeless. We are not helpless in Texas. Uh, we can get on the right footing, but it does start with having a, car a court that is impartial. And I'm happy to go into the background on some of these folks. Uh, I mean, John Devine, I'll just spend a little bit of time on him. John Devine campaigned on his own wife's high-risk pregnancy. He has campaigned on um, being arrested several times for um, um, protesting in front of abortion clinics. And I want to just do one more thing. I don't want to take up all the time here I know, um, with, with Representative Crockett, but with, with um, Jimmy Blacklock, in 2018, Governor, all you have to know about this guy is what Governor Abbott said about him in 2018 at a Texas ra uh, rally for life. Governor Abbott said, I don't have to guess or wonder how Justice Blacklock is going to decide cases because of his proven record of fighting for pro-life pro -life causes. Um, and so, look, I mean, this is when you're when you've gone through a very traumatic experience, when you are now going through the court seeking justice. I mean, the, the court is stacked. J uh, John Jane Bland, excuse me, she herself, actually, she wrote the opinion in a case uh, that when the Texas Supreme Court uh, ruled um, that um, anti-abortion groups could not be held liable for defamation for equating abortion with murder. So, I mean, these are the folks that are on the court. There is no impartiality uh, when it comes to, to, to this issue. So we can do better, we will do better by unseating Jimmy, John, and Jane. Uh Congressman Crockett, you were a Texas legislator uh, before you became a U.S. Congress member. So you know the players in this whole thing, and we, you and I have had conversations about this in the past. One of the issues we've learned, though, from the, 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 the post-abortion law uh, reality in Texas is that even the exceptions don't make sense. Texas is almost proof of the, uh, the, the, the point that when you carve out exceptions, but you have courts like this, the exceptions don't matter. If you have a high risk pregnancy in Texas or you have a pregnancy that you do not want to complete, you're just you're, you're you're out of luck. Yeah. So when we were dealing with this law, um, I was still in the Texas House. And one of the things that they made sure that they did is made sure that the language was vague. Part of making language vague, whether it's on a state level or the federal level, is to make sure that there is chaos and confusion. And unfortunately, the chaos and confusion in the state of Texas is leading to casualties. Um, and in addition to the fact that they just want people to give up. Um, and, and, you know, I applaud the Kate Cox of the world because she is privileged enough. She was able to leave the state. But Kate just wanted to make sure that for those women that don't, have the same privileges as she does, that at least something was documented in some way. And so she took her very private story, very public, not just looking out for herself, but looking out for other women that unfortunately will not have the ability to flee the state. And I do want to go back just really quickly and talk about Dr. Gennard, because one of the things that is so ironic about Dr. Gennard's situation is, number one, she is an OBGYN, but she's an OBGYN who is married to an OBGYN. So just imagine two people who are medically trained and then having the likes of, while we don't have a Marjorie Taylor Greene in the state house, we do have people that may be on her same level as far as how informed or uninformed they are. They're the ones that wrote the laws that somehow now govern what Dr. Denard and her husband have to live by. And something tells me they know a little bit more. And we know that Dr. Denard, this was her third child that she was trying to have. And unfortunately, we ended up in this scenario where people have no idea what they're doing, but they are dictating our lives. And the final thing that I'm going to say is that it recently came out that over 20,000 women in the state of Texas, I think approximately 22,000 women have been impregnated as a result of rape in the last year. And they had no options, over 22,000. Now you tell me that we live in a non third world country because it sounds like we're living in a third world country right now and we should and can do better. 